All right, everybody. My guest on the show today, James Whitelock, Managing Director of Thinking Circles, an award-winning digital marketing recruitment agency, as you're about to find out, definitely based in the UK with a lovely British accent. James, I love (laughs) the Brits, love the accent, and a fellow podcast host, host of the amazing show, The Marketing Rules. James, Good afternoon to you because you are in the UK and it is still morning here on the East Coast. How are you today? I'm 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 doing really well. It is a pleasure to be here, Jason. Thank you for uh, inviting me on. Um, yeah, I cannot wait. It's uh, I, I've uh, it's a great show you've got. I've listened to a couple of couple of Thank episodes you. and um, excellent. It's uh, it's a good format and uh, it's I'm looking forward to kind of the next kind of forty five minutes and just having a a chat. Yeah, I I don't think James and I we've 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 gotten to know each other a little bit off the air. I, I'm just going to say it. I, I love British people. I just, I have a, like a thing for like British accents and the British culture. So I'm, this is a great way to start my Fridays. Talk to us. Somebody listen to the beautiful sounds of a nice uh, British accent. Well, I'll, I'll bring tr- you up early here. I'll, 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 I'll try and be as British as possible. I forgot my, <laughs> I, fo- I forgot my bowler hat and my copy of the times, but, um, and, uh, well, no. that would be amazing if you came on with a bowler hat. That would be amazing. <laughs> All right, James. All right, let's uh, let's get right into it. So, James, what's um, what's something that you nerd out about? So, I am a massive comic book fan. Um, this, you know, so comic books aren't really a huge thing in the UK. Well, they weren't kind of up until about you know ten years ago when Marvel started kind of releasing all their movies. But um, yeah. I've been a massive comic book fan since I was a kid, and I'm a, a, a big kind of DC over Marvel fan, basically. So I've still okay. got you can't see it, I know, uh, because obviously this is audio. But right next to me, I've got a I've got piles and piles of, of boxes of, of comics full of Batman and all those kinds of characters from across the years. You know, from the the late sixties yeah. all the way up to kind of like the kind of two thousands. Um, again, not very good for audio, but you can't see it. But I have a, a an entire kind of sleeve of uh, tattoos of yes, you Superman and and wow. the Flash and and all of and kind of all of the Justice League. So I am a you really do. I am a full on uh, comic book nerd. You're you know, a full I'm on committed. I'm committed. Right. Oh you know. my gosh, it's I always uh, I'm always. Uh, amazed at how the world or how the universe puts us together so on this week on the show that my episode that released this week we're recording this on march 25th i had laura westman and bay leblanc Kleine. they're the host of a podcast called west of wonderland mm-hmm. and they are disney fanatics so james we literally went through and talked about who we most identify with in the disney world and the marvel world and the uh, star wars world and the funny thing is bay told us she said well i most identify with Wonder Woman, who she is, but like, but that's a DC. And she said, but I believe she should be Marvel. So now I want to get your input on that. And then I will go back to Bay and say, hey, I've got a, either a, the same opinion or a differing opinion. Wonder Woman, Marvel, or DC? Uh, Where does she really belong? Uh, it's an interesting one. So, so she, she's full on DC, right? There's no two ways, no, mm-hmm. no two ways about it. Um, but, you know, this whole kind of Marvel versus DC thing, it's a bit like kind of the Beatles versus the Stones, Oasis versus Blur. <laughs> And it's kind of, right. you know what, you know what people, you can like both. It doesn't really They're matter. You know what I mean? You could, <laughs> exactly. you know, it, it's not an either or kind of situation here. So, um, and I've yeah. got, and I've got a load of kind of Marvel stuff and I did like Marvel. I just, just gravitated more towards certain characters. So yeah. it wasn't really kind of more around kind of DC Marvel. It was more around certain characters. Yeah. I just, I liked kind of Batman and those kind of things. Sure. So I went in that direction, but yeah, um, it's interesting yeah. though. It's in the whole, whole, this whole kind of like comic book culture is kind of how it's exploded over the last kind of like 20 years with, um, with the Marvel and the DC and the Batman and the Chris Nolan Batman movies and things like that. Um, and it's much more, and it's totally yeah. mainstream now. Whereas when I was collecting, you know, it, it, I was a nerd, right? I was a complete nerd. It yeah, was just, it, was it was weird to be yeah. like, oh my gosh. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I was, I, I didn't tell people about it, right? It was a whole kind of thing where I was, I was a kid, I loved the comics, went into my teens, it was like, it was kind of like a dirty little secret, you know what I mean? Just holding <laughs> on to these comics because you didn't want anyone to know that, you, you know, that you were a kind of full on geek around this kind of stuff. So, and then as I got yeah. older, I just didn't care less and just kind of like, lent, completely lent into it. So. All right. I got a couple more questions for you. Sure. Here. Um, one favorite Batman movie out wow. of all the Batman films. Wow. So and have you seen the new Batman? Have you seen the Batman? Twice. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> of course. Right. Of course. Um, yeah. So I'm, uh, I quite like the, the 89 Michael Keaton 
version of Batman. Yeah, yeah, I quite like the that. Tim Burton, it's yeah, amazing. Exactly, and it, it kind of um, it leans very much into the comics. You know, it's kind of got a kind of a, mm-hmm. a comic book sensibility about it. Whereas these more kind of setting it in the real world sometimes doesn't feel comic book enough. You know, um, yeah. and so that's why I quite like that. It's you know, it's got villains who are kind of just a bit weird and crazy, and you know they wouldn't exist in the real world, and they're quite. It's a comic book after all, right? You know, this is how comic books yeah. work. They're, they're fantasy, they're escapism. We don't need to set it in, in a real life situation. So I think that's that's my favorite. That said, I've got a lot of time yeah. for, for the other ones. However, one of my yeah. one of my favorite all time versions of Batman um is the Adam West sixty six version, which I've you know, which amazing. I would, I've got a lot so of so campy and amazing. Exactly, right? It is and it, it, and it um and that's where kind of Batman kind of started. It was a bit more a bit more kind of lighthearted. Yeah. You know, and uh I've got a lot of time for that. I can watch those over and over again. I think they're they're great fun. I, I'm I'm glad you said that. I actually I used to watch that show. I'm forty four, so that show was pretty popular in the eighties. And the thing that I remember the most is one, the the villains are so ridiculous. Yeah. And two, when they would climb up the building and you're like, it's so obvious that they're not actually climbing up anything. They're just, they've just tilted the camera 90 degrees. Hilarious. Exactly. Yeah, it's brilliant. brilliant. I'll, um, so for, I'll just offer this before we move on. The Dark Knight is one of my top 10 all time favorite films. I just, mm-hmm. it's to me, it's, it's a pretty much a perfect film, but I am a, cl- but the 89 is a close second for me. Yeah. I just, that I need to go back and watch it. It's just so good. And like yeah. Kim Basinger and Jack yeah. Nicholson just, that Amazing. combined with with Batman Returns, the you know the sequel, um, they're, yeah, they're very good. They're good. They're good. Uh, they're good comic book movies. Yeah, that's awesome. All right, so James, um, something. Tell us about something that's inside of your comfort zone that you know other people are not comfortable doing. Um, so this is clearly contrary to what we'll kind of we'll, we'll come on to. I think with some of the other questions, but um, public speaking and presenting. Okay, I am. I'm. Uh-huh. I'm. I, I, you know. I'm very happy and comfortable with that. And it's, I always kind of see it as a bit like a muscle that the more you do it, the you kind of the better you get and the more you train it. But I know people who can go through their yeah. entire kind of lives and careers without ever kind of doing any presenting, any public speaking or anything like that. Not debating, yeah. which I know, you know, in America is a slightly different thing, but definitely um, uh, kind of public speaking and, uh, you know, the podcast has helped towards that. Being a, a yeah. you know, managing director, you have to kind of, we present at kind of shows and all those kind of things and other and, and expos and conferences. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, you know, I'm really kind of, I've grown to become very comfortable in that scenario. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I had a, I had a, a guest I interviewed earlier this week that'll be releasing probably after your episode is, uh, he's a speaker too. Like he's mm-hmm. a keynote speaker. And I, I asked him for those who want to, get more into speaking or have a, a level of discomfort, what would you recommend? He says, well, one, having a little bit of discomfort is probably a good thing. It's kind of like the pregame. If you're an athlete, it's like the pregame, pregame jitters, pregame excitement, mm-hmm. <clears throat> because physiologically your mind views fear and excitement in the same way. Like it feels this it, it, like a, at like a, you know, at a subconscious level. Mm-hmm. So you can reframe that. And two, what he said is the best way to get over speaking is one, there's skills around it. But just as importantly, be over prepared so that you don't have to worry about what you're going to talk about. Mm-hmm. And I said that is really because I'm more of an improviser. I like public speaking. I'm more of an improviser, and I I tend to not over prepare because I find that that gets me in my head. But I think as I get on stages and stuff, or you're especially if you're doing a pitch, like I was reading, you know, Steve Jobs, one of the most incredible presenters of all time around products and services. Mm-hmm. I read that he spent. For like the the big Apple launches, like the yearly Apple launch, I read that he prepared between 150 200 hours for each one of those with his team. They ran through it like a 50 times, like the tech. It wasn't like he showed up. He's like, "Oh, here's what we're gonna do today." It's like he was prepared, and yeah. that's why they were so impactful. Yeah. So that's awesome. Yeah. No, I I can I can understand that, and that, that definitely that preparedness helps. But there's there's a point where you were over prepared, right? You 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 kind of you got too totally. much going on, right? And uh, um you know i don't use kind of like uh notes or cards or anything presenting and and as i've kind of got more and more uh used to kind of presenting and public speaking the amount i kind of have on for instance if we're presenting at a conference and we need kind of we've got a slideshow of some kind right the yeah. amount of content that's on those slideshows over the years has got less and less and less because i'm more and more yeah. confident that i can just speak around these kind of topics and i don't necessarily need it all in front of me 
uh, and present it. So you yeah. don't have reams and reams. You know, it's not death by PowerPoint, basically. Um, yeah. But I, as I said, I, I always equate it to a muscle. Just the more you do it, the more you become comfortable yeah. with it, right? Um, and whatever your technique is to become comfortable, whether it's your breathing exercises, whether it's just, you know, um, you know, doing it with someone else as well. That always is a really good thing is kind of tag yeah. it, you know? Um, you just kind of, the more you do it, the more you get kind of uh, used to it. And the same with kind of being on camera, the same with kind of interviewing mm-hmm. people, you know, I'm sure you, you possibly like me the first time I I'd interviewed anyone uh, for, for the podcast, I stank. I was terrible. Right. Yeah. I mean, I was oh, so, yeah, yeah. so busy trying to kind of copy every other kind of podcast that was out there. Totally. That I loved um, and just forgot to be me. Uh, and that's also yeah. kind of one of those things why, why people are listening to you it's not they're listening because you know, they, most of the people listening to you don't listen because they know because they have heard of me they're listening because of you, you and you've got yeah. you've got someone on as a guest um and you know you just get you, you just get comfortable with it over time that's what i've kind of found yeah yeah you remind me james you remind me of um i love tim ferris and tim ferris i i heard him on one of his episodes and he's i think he's done a few he's done a few hundred episodes now with his <laughs> show and he was saying that sometimes he likes to go back and listen to his first season <laughs> just so he can like realize how far he's come and he's like hey and as i continue down this path i'm probably going to come back to listen to this season and realize how far i've come and you're just always going to be working on your craft it's never going to be perfect and i think what you said is really true you can't be somebody else on stage you can't be somebody else as a podcast so it's the best version of you is always just going to be you and people are going to sniff it out otherwise exactly i went back and actually re-edited some of the kind of like the first 10 episodes of our podcast i went back and re-edited and stripped out i used to do this kind of bit of this bit of waffle basically right at the start and i was pretending to be another podcaster there's a uh, you know <laughs> basically there's a guy called um uh, adam buxton in in the uk who does a, he's a very funny guy he does all these kind of interviews very famous people at the start of every episode it's him out walking his dog and he's kind of doing a kind of a little audio piece he takes a little kind of a zoom kind of recorder thing and I tried to copy yeah. that, and it was just like, oh my god, I've got nothing to say. I'm so boring, <laughs> Jesus. So I just, I literally went back, cut all those out, and uh, they're they're much better for just kind of cutting to the chase. So yeah, I think yeah, that's so right. the beauty of podcasting. Be like, that doesn't work, so yeah. let's go back and get rid of it. And nobody ever knows it's there when they listen to the podcast. Exactly. exactly. All right, so James, um, we look at the flip of that question. What's something you're uncomfortable doing that you know other people like doing, or they are it's in their wheelhouse? Um, so kind of contrary to what I just said, I'm I'm really not good at networking or kind of working a room uh when it comes to kind mm. of you know rooms with big crowds and you kind of put in that scenario i'd suddenly become actually quite shy um and i think this is you know this is an introvert extra thing going on here really um mm. so i can't i can't I, I, there's part of me that just doesn't do small talk very well so kind of that opening gambit and online to kind of to to, to start to talk but i'm just not very good at um i'm mm. much more kind of detailed or just kind of subject focused get me on talking about a certain subject and i'm, I'm away but you know yeah. that kind of small talk i'm not great at and i think that's where what kind of you know you know why i'm not very good in that situation whereas i know people who can just literally work a room you know you know those people when you've seen those people at kind of conferences and and networking events where they literally just kind of go around and you know and they're just like wow that's how are they doing that you know <laughs> um but yeah. no i just can't do that i just cannot do that yeah well this is a <clears throat> i like when guests uh, i've had a couple of guests say this one um, just because I have a large sample set and like, I'm that person. I like, I'm a complete extrovert. I love walking into a room where I know nobody. Mm-hmm. I have zero fear. Yeah. Like, all right, I'm going to meet some people and maybe we'll have deep conversations. Maybe we won't. Small talk is great. Medium. I, I, um, or if you watch Curb Your Enthusiasm, it's mm-hmm. an American show with Larry yeah. David, but he's, there's an amazing episode. It's actually an episode with Ricky Gervais yeah. and he's sitting at a dinner table and he's like, he's like, yeah, he's like, how do you feel about elevating our small talk to medium talk? And then he says something to the guy. He's like, he's like, so uh, how often do you have sex with your wife? <laughs> the guy's like, what? <laughs> Can't believe you asked me that. But like, there you go. Just come up with a really, really boisterous question yeah. to get people like, we're not talking small talk anymore. I'm not sure the English sensibility would stand for that. You know, I think I might, no. get, I might get kicked out quite quickly out of a, uh, exactly. Out of a, exactly. a, a networking event if I did that. Um, yeah, <laughs> Exactly. Uh, All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about speaking. So if I was, if everybody on the planet was going to listen to this episode, which would be amazing for both of us, (laughs) I don't think it's going to happen. We can wish. Mm -hmm. And you could deliver five minute, a five minute message and, you know, not asking for you to do that here in the, on the show. What would you speak about and what would you want us to do with the information? In other words, what would be your call to action to us after like, after you speak to us? I think, you know, it's, it's quite simple, right? I think there's two things that, that we need to do. Read more and travel more. 
two easy things, mm-hmm. right? Get 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 to know the world, understand the world a bit better, understand the people in our world, understand the different viewpoints in our world, um, and then exercise that. Go visit the, you know, go to these different places, go over, travel the world. Now, I'm not the most traveled person, but I have traveled a little bit, um, and I'm totally the better for it. Um, and over the last few years, I've definitely been reading a lot more. I make a, a, a you know an effort to read a lot more. And it doesn't matter what you read, right? Just, you know, it, for one, just build your vocabulary. It just makes you more worldly. It doesn't necessarily, you know, there, obviously there are certain books you should probably be reading, but you know what I mean? Having just a broader experience of life through, through, through the reading and through travel uh, are going to make you a better person, the people you're visiting a better person. Um, uh, and I think that's just one of the things that uh, we should all do more of. Now, I know obviously financially not everybody in the world is able to do that, but and there might be all kind of other kind of issues associated around that these days with kind of um, with, with regards to the economy and yes. regards to, you know, the uh, ecology. But it is, I think it just, you can just make you a much, much better person, you know, uh, if you can kind of uh, yeah. visit other parts of the world and read about other parts of the world and just you know, expand your mind. Yeah, I love that, James. So two questions before we run to the commercial break here. Number one, where's the next trip? Where's the next location you're going to for fun? so probably, or you'd like to go for fun if you don't have it planned yet so um i had a very big kind of uh holiday out to southeast asia uh cancelled uh during kind of covid so that was a trip to, yeah. to vietnam cambodia and, yeah. and thailand so uh at some point that needed to be rebooked uh and kind of yeah. find my way over there uh but before then i would imagine i'm i like a lot of people kind of need a bit of just a holiday i need some sun i need a beach so um, you know, a trip to Greece or something from where we are in the UK is probably quite a nice kind of trip out. But you know, my travel is trying to be like it's. I don't do as much for work anymore, but you know, it's kind of a, a year on of just a little little one week holiday somewhere, and then a year next year mm-hmm. it's a kind of a slightly larger, maybe take kind of three weeks off, maybe a month or something, and go do a bit of traveling. But uh, yeah, so Greece uh, probably next, that. but then after that, a bigger one to Southeast Asia. Yeah, um, awesome. And second question, what's a, what's a great book you've read recently that you can recommend to all of us? So, um, I quite like, uh, the, what was it called now? The, um, uh, so I read 1984 again recently, uh, by George Orwell. It's <laughs> a is, very, it's a very timely book. Which is, which is, uh, it, it is. And it, you know, from, from a book, from a book that age, it doesn't seem to age. You know what I mean? There's, all, there's always something in it. Okay. There's always there's a lot of truth in there. There's a something yeah. in it. Um, so if you haven't read it, go back, go have a read of it. It's not very long. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, it's, it's still a good book even today. Um, and yeah. You'll get through it. You'll get through it in kind of like a couple of, a couple of hours basically. So yeah, go, go, yeah. Check, go check that out. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, thanks for everything you've shared with us so far, James. Uh, We're going to take a real brief commercial break. We'll be right back after this. The Talking to Cool People podcast is brought to you by Jason Frizzell Coaching. Jason works with amazing people who are looking to find and develop their passion and purpose and create their journey to wherever it is they want to go. Check us out at jasonfrizzell.com, Facebook, or on Instagram. Jason loves hearing from anyone who thinks it would be cool to connect, to be coached, or to be a guest on our show. Email him at podcast at jasonfrizzell.com or DM him on Facebook and Instagram. And now, back to some more amazing conversation on talking to cool people. All right, James, we're back. What else would you like us to know about you? So we know that you are a comic book guy. You travel, you read, you know, you like to speak. We know you don't like to work a room, but you will if you need to. What else would you like us to know about you? Um, so I'm actually educated uh, as a fine artist. So my degree is in oh, wow. my degree is in fine art. So I studied painting, printmaking, and sculpture uh, as my uh, as my degree. And um, it's one of the things I've only ever been that good at was was being able to kind of draw and paint. And so um it's pretty useless in the real world but uh it was the only thing i was ever kind of good at as a kid um mm. i wasn't particularly academic so yeah so that was um that's my background and it kind of on a strange kind of you know trajectory led me to where i where i am today through kind of becoming a graphic designer a web designer web manager digital strategist marketeer basically 
uh, and um, an agency owner as as as, a, as of now. So, yeah, that um, I've got a lot to kind of thank my kind of uh, kind of teachers who kind of encouraged me to kind of go in that direction. But yeah, so yeah, trained as a fine artist, I you know I I'd have exhibited in the past and things like that. I've worked. Nice. I've uh, um, I don't know if 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 anyone listening is uh, a kind of a fan of kind of sculptors, but there's a very famous UK, British sculptor called uh, Sir Anthony Gormley, who I uh, who I worked for uh as a wow. for for a while we uh he had a whole team of kind of apprentices basically uh welding all of his sculptures together so um that was one of my kind of skills i learned at, I learned at university when when making when sculpture making so yeah plasma art cutting welding all that kind of stuff and uh i can i can do um yeah do you still do you still dabble in it when you have time <sighs> not really no um i describe it that i i, I look and collect art really well but not actually kind of, I can't do any of the other stuff anymore. Um, and I just don't kind of have the time, I suppose. I, I, I appreciate yeah. it more than I do now. So that's, that's where, that's where my kind of uh, devotion to art lays now in, in, yeah. in looking at it. This is where, um, as I get to know my guests, you know, and record it for everybody listening, like, Oh yeah, I like comic books. I like to speak. I'm like, I have almost zero artistic ability. I'm a musician. <laughs> so I'm, I play guitar, so I'm mm-hmm. I'm decent at that. So that that you would call artistic, but the amount of respect I have for people that can like weld stuff together. <laughs> I mean, I could weld something together like utilitarian to like make these two pieces so they don't break. But like the idea of taking any sort of sculpture or any sort of piece of stone or clay and making it look into anything other than it looks like a three year old did it, like would be, <laughs> I think is a near impossibility for me. I wouldn't even know where to begin. Um, I would, yeah, yeah. So. Mad well, respect. I think that's such an incredible talent that people have. Oh, that I certainly wish. I don't know that I wish I had more of it. I just have an incredible amount of respect for it. Because it's so far out of anything I would know how to do. <laughs> well, if it if it helps, uh, I cannot play a, um, a musical instrument. I've tried, um, but I just don't have the. I don't have the patience. That's the thing. I suppose that's yeah. one of the things about kind of art is it's quite. It can be quite immediate. Whereas actually yeah. trying trying to learn a, a skill like like playing a guitar takes years okay and i just don't have that it does. i don't have that patience i don't have that patience so yeah that's interesting all right james so i love when i have fellow podcast host on because now i'm going to give you i'm going to let you to be the host of my show for a couple minutes and ask me something and you're going to ask me anything you want that i can answer for you for you and everybody listening so what would you like to ask me about so on the off the back of us talking about kind of reading and travel um you asked me what i've recently read what is your favorite favorite novel? Not not business book. We're not counting business books. Yeah, yeah. Count novel. Yeah, I'm going to be very American with this answer. <laughs> Go on. The Great Gatsby. Really? Okay, I tried to read that recently. I, I just you did read it. Uh, well, I tried to. <laughs> it, I didn't get it's all the very way American. Yeah. It, well, no, I don't think that. I think there was just a certain kind of prose that I just I couldn't kind of get through uh yeah he has a very distinct uh f scott f scott fitzgerald has a very distinct yeah. style yeah yeah um i don't there's just something about that but it, you know for me it's partly um it's partly i have some nostalgia for it because mm-hmm. it is it's ba- it's required reading so i i grew up in minnesota and f scott f scott fitzgerald of the minnesota for a long time so it's like required reading you're gonna read <laughs> i think probably read it in like seventh or eighth grade or mm-hmm. maybe freshman year in high school um but now that i you know and I'm, I'm processing this one of my favorite books actually now that i think about it and it is fiction but it's it's based on a story is a, a book called the things they carried mm-hmm. i don't know if you've read that before no no tell me about it it's um it's about and I, I, God, I cannot remember the name of the author right now but it's a collection of short stories about the Vietnam War, right. and they're from different different viewpoints. Some of the stories are quite violent; some of them are not. And I'd recently listened to the audiobook, and the audiobook is narrated by Brian Cranston, who I love. Right, Brian Cranston from Breaking Bad, and yep, and all that other those other things. It's a quite famous book, and it's just the way it's written is so powerful, and it's so heartbreaking, and. It's you could call it a political book. It's mm-hmm. obviously like anti-war. I think it, but I think it came out in because I remember reading it in high school, and I was in high school in the '90s. So I think it must have come out in the late '80s or early '90s. But it's an incredibly powerful book, 
Tim so O'Brien, that, Tim O'Brien, I think it is, or Tim, Tim O'Brien. O'Brien. That's yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, that's. I mean, it's sold. It's a quite famous book. Yeah, the things they carried. I would highly recommend that if you have a stomach for that style. The storytelling is unbelievable. There, it, it's sad. Yeah, it's um, it's about Viet- the Vietnam War. So there's things, but it's just really powerful. And he he's a vet. He was a vet. He was a soldier in the Vietnam War. And now that you say that. That and then the other book that I just absolutely adore is The Stand by Stephen King. Okay. I just think that book is, I don't know if you ever read it, it's it's a beast, man. It's over a thousand pages, but it's just I like I like post apocalyptic stuff for mm-hmm. some reason. And it's all about like the end of the world and yeah. then there's like a few people living and yeah. good versus evil. So yeah. I gave you a long winded answer, I gave you three answers. <laughs> so I was like you, you this know is how my mind this is how my demented mind works. I'm like, oh it's this, but I'm like no, it's this and this. But it's, I don't like to choose. But it's like one of those things when someone asks you any of your favorite things. There's always more, it's so hard to pick one, right? You know, it's like your yeah. favorite movie, and it's like, oh well, I like this, yeah. but I like this as well. And then you, yeah. you, you suddenly you've got you've got five or ten even, and you can't choose between them. They're the ones you always go back to. So yeah, yeah. I, it's a bit of a it, it's a bit of a trick question, really, to to, to, to name. Yeah. One. Well, the other thing I'm realizing now is it's like my eccentric taste of like classic American literature, and like violent vietnam and like fiction about post-apocalyptic <laughs> nuclear <laughs> nuclear a, holocaust and diseases yeah stephen but, king but then there's a the great gatsby as well so it's all kind of you know it, it swings and roundabouts <laughs> exactly great question nobody's ever asked me that thank you oh, all right james let's see what else do i want to ask you how about uh what are you passionate about james um again that's a tricky question right because there's a few things i could probably help uh, uh kind of answer but um for the last kind of i suppose 10 or 15 years i've been very much into trying to keep fit and the way that has then helped my mental health and kept me sane at times um that i've become very very passionate about and i've become you know bordering mm-hmm. on obsessed i guess uh and not preachy but you know, it's something that I think is now just kind of part of my DNA is kind of going to the gym, you know, working out, having that time to uh, you know switch off, think about other things, or concentrate on something specific. Yeah. You know, I mean, whatever my brain needs to do at that point, sure. you know, then that's kind of. And yeah. um, I think that you know, just a little bit of exercise for everybody can go a long way. And I think from all the kind, I think we now around kind of mental health. We know that kind of exercise can help and it doesn't have to be going to the gym. You don't have to be a gym bunny like me. You can just go for a walk. You can just go for a quick run. You can just do some going up and down the stairs, anything, right? We're kind of, everything is incremental and it always kind of helps. Um, One of my favorite tips around this, and uh, I was kind of like, if you're lucky enough to live in a house that has an upstairs bathroom and a downstairs bathroom, and maybe depending on where you work, if you're working from home or wherever you are, take the one that's further, go to the one that's furthest away right and get a few steps in basically you know what i mean yeah and do that kind of thing and just kind of make the make little efforts like that um and i think you'll kind of find that you just feel just just better for it physically mentally uh yeah yeah i love that james i i'm also somebody i like um i'm big into i'm big into walking mm-hmm. that's my thing like i just don't like the feeling of running i do i like to lift i like to do crossfit cycling i just don't like to run but what you just said about exercise is one of the, it's one of the few things and what I see in the health and nutrition space that is indisputable. Nobody's going to tell you that getting a decent amount of exercise per day, like it's just proven. I was actually talking to somebody yesterday and they were telling me about how, um, they're having some GI issues, just some like stomach stuff. And their doctor's mm-hmm. like, Hey, we're going to do this. We're going to do this, do this, get some exercise every day. Like just do it. It's good hormonally. It's good for your brain. It's just a great thing. And then the second thing I want to give to you is that badass tattoo you have on your arm looks a lot better when you got some muscle underneath it. So yeah, <laughs> keep it going. You know, like I, I see people with tattoos on their like on their arms, and then I'm like, but they're not working out anymore. I'm like, it kind of loses its shape because when it's it doesn't look as good. <laughs> well, yeah, there you go. There's there's a tip for anybody. If you you know before you get your tattoos, get ripped. There you go. You know? <laughs> yeah. Or, or 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 yeah, like because then otherwise, like I was looking at um. Uh, I don't know if you like Dwayne. I love Dwayne Johnson and he's mm-hmm. always posting pictures of him working out and mm-hmm. he's got like those amazing, like I think there's Samoan tattoos on his arms and like he must get them touched up because he gets bigger and smaller <laughs> and like they, they must like, 
I guess as you get to a certain point, they kind of separate a little bit. If you grow your 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 tries and your buys, they would separate out. Well, I think. you know, I I, I, you know, not, I, I don't I don't know if I have that. I don't know how if I have that problem. I'm not as big as the rock, right? You know, you're not quite as big as the rock. <laughs> Close, <laughs> but um. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I guess he did. They do distort and then kind of over time anyway, right? Uh, kind of tattoos. Yeah. So um, yeah, he probably does. And I think his are only black and white. So that's even easier. And it's cheaper. That's true. It's cheaper. I'm it's not the, cheap. Yeah. That's that's definitely the reason that he's gone black and white is because it's cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> because he doesn't have a huge amount of money, right? He's got, he doesn't. He's, he's working he doesn't, to a budget. You know, like, he's, yeah. he's working to a it's budget. He's a rock, you know? So, yeah. You know, yeah, so, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> that's cool, James. Um, so what's, uh, what's the thing that you're most proud of um so i think yeah, over the last kind of uh, 10 years since i've started running thinking circles um it's we've had our ups and downs but just being able to kind of now have a, a fairly successful business uh with some great people in my team um with great clients great customers uh, and a great reputation in our in in our market i think that's you know one of the things i'm most proud of because it's not easy, right? You'll know this from being a, a businessman oh, yourself. Yeah. You know, it's not easy running yes. a business, and I don't know what the the, the figures are no. around people who who aren't able to kind of make it work through no fault of their own. There's obviously always a little yeah. bit, bit of possibly a bit of luck involved. Um, but uh, yeah, getting to the stage we are today and still going after ten years, uh, that's what I'm kind of uh, I'm really proud of. Yeah, that's amazing. I. Yeah, we got some time. I, w- I would love to talk to you a little bit more about this as a successful entrepreneur. The I saw, I'm trying to think where I saw this. It doesn't matter. I saw a statistic that, and this is a US based survey. I think it's either four or five percent of all working adults in the United States will ever own their own business of any type. So, like this glamorous thing around entrepreneurship and oh, we have all these entrepreneurs. Not many people do it. Mm. Yeah, which I don't think is a good thing or a bad thing. It's just it's not it's not for the faint of heart. Yeah, is the way. What well, I tell I, I tell you what what uh, and, and this isn't one of your questions, but what does annoy me? I think uh, kind of TV programs like The Apprentice um, and uh, is it is it oh. uh, is it Shark Tank or whatever it is one of those kind of like ones where you Shark are Tank, yeah. yeah you're kind of. Um, you know, it gives a false impression of what it is to be a business owner and what it is to relaunch a product and the kind of things you need to do yeah. around that. It's all, and I think that, uh, I don't think that helps the entrepreneurial cause, right? Because you just get these people who, we, yeah. who are just, it just doesn't, that whole kind of scenario doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel real world. Uh, it doesn't go through what actually happens when right. you are trying to kind of run a business. And, um, and it doesn't matter any business, whether it's a, you know, if you're just your, uh, just yourself, a solo entrepreneur, whether you've got a you know a team of 10, yeah. 50, 200, thousands, there are different different issues, and um, yeah. and there are always things to kind of that are gonna gonna be barriers that are gonna be put up against you. But I, yeah, yeah, my 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 real bugbear is those kind of those TV shows that just oh. have a false impression of what it is to be a to be a business person. Yeah, like it's it's uh, yeah, because what's what's interesting news is either the spectacular fails. Like Theranos and, you know, like, Tra- I don't know if you have this in the UK, but um, Travis Kalanick, you know, from, he was the CEO of Uber. Mm. He's now, there's a whole show called, there's a whole show on Hulu. He's played by Joseph Gordon-Levitt, you know, Bat- yeah. speaking of Batman references, yep. um, who's playing him. There's a show on right now with Amanda Seyfried playing Elizabeth Holmes from Theranos. Mm-hmm. So like the, the, what's interesting to people is either like the spectacular success, success stories, like zuck and you know social network which wasn't so positive for him but you know obviously he's a success story Mm -hmm. or the spectacular fails but in between is like actually where all the work happens yeah and uh so we've got people this i I know i have entrepreneurs listening or people that maybe want to be entrepreneurs of uh, all different industries what would you say to somebody who's maybe a year maybe a two in they see a possibility but it's not going as they expected. And I would guess that that's everybody listening because I've never met an entrepreneur Mm -hmm. who after a year or two, I'm like, so how's it going? They're like, it's going, it's going so well. It's like, it's going better than I could have expected. It's like, it's, there's never, and I am speaking from my personal experience, like people going to entrepreneurship, like you said, whether it's solopreneur, like I work for myself, I have like some, you know, support stuff, but I work for myself. You have a team. We do this because we want the freedom to run our own business and think we know how to do it. And then what ends up happening is not that much freedom all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're, you're right. 
and I think that's a good thing to kind of to to explain to people is is running your business takes takes hard work. It takes up all of your time, <clears throat> and uh, sometimes for very little gain, with not much coming in. Um, yeah, and I guess one of the things I would suggest is don't get ho- kind of hooked up on the word entrepreneur and just just mm-hmm. be what you, you want to be. Uh, do your thing. Don't yeah. worry about being an. Uh, the <clears throat> definition of an entrepreneur is someone who takes risks and who b- buys and sells companies. Most of us won't ever get to that stage, right? We're just business people, yeah. and we do what we can. We like to work with the clients we've got. We work to work with the people in our in our teams and our suppliers and everything else, and we're just good at that. There's going to be tough times. I remember the first when I the first year that I set up my business, it was so bad that I started looking for a, uh, in air quotes a real job, you know. But I had yeah. some good people around me and just said, "Look, no, just stick with it. You're." You, you know you seem to be good at what you do and just stick with it and i think that's the other thing is you're gonna we're all gonna go through you're always gonna have bad times right there's no such thing as as, as you're always gonna hit dips there's always gonna be de- global depressions there's always gonna be something going on that is gonna be able to affect what you do um and you just have to stick with it and, and partly it's a it's a kind of a mental attitude as opposed to just actually you know as a as a physical doing stuff basically as well so those are the things i think yeah i, I would offer yeah i love that i i'm gonna add one thing to here the being good at what you do is not enough because mm-hmm. if nobody knows about it and i mean this is what you do for a living right mm-hmm. marketing so i do yeah. i do you, we've I, can i do brand strategy for for personal brands and i'm a former salesperson so i know and this happens a lot in, in like the coaching consulting industry and in public speaking kind of like authors you can be the best and you're not going to have a successful business without some sort of ability for people to find out about you. Mm-hmm. I think that's, uh, I know a lot of amazingly talented people and they just don't, they either don't know how to market and sell themselves or they, and they're not willing to invest in somebody else to help them. So they end up, they end up never going anywhere and they're amazing. Yeah. yeah. But there's so many amazing people in the marketplace who also have good sales and marketing. So the idea, like, and I know, I don't, you probably know a lot of people like this. So they're like, Oh my God, I hate sales and marketing. I'm like, well, then you can, you can expect to, to, you know, to flounder around and hope that you build a referral based business, which takes much longer Yeah, and you can do it. You can do it through referrals, but it's just, it's just a longer game. Just be ready for the longer game. If you do that. Um, and it's a great point though. I mean, you would probably wouldn't do your own taxes, right? So why would you no. do any other? So uh, anyone who's kind of setting up their own business, do what you do well and what you want to, and what you want to do within the business and just outsource the rest. Okay. Just do exactly. it. Exactly. There's, there's someone out there who can help you with all of this. If you don't want it, there's yeah. also tools out there that can help you just outsource it. You yeah. know? Just, just don't bother with kind of trying to kind of struggle around and exactly. doing it with yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Short term financial investment for a lot. You're playing the long game. Yeah. You want yeah. to play the long game. All right. So James, I call this my, my therapy question. <laughs> I love this question. What's something that you're afraid might actually be true about you? So this is an interesting one. So actually following on from the, the previous question is that, Maybe I'm not as good at my job as people think I am. <laughs> that perfect. That I have, I have massive imposter syndrome. Okay, basically, um, uh-huh. and that yeah. uh, I think I know. I think I'm good at it, but at some point, surely someone's going to catch me out, right? You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and I know definitely within within my own team, one of my ethos is, is always employ people who know more than you do. Um, and you know, I've got a team of people who are way more kind of experienced than I am, but you know, for some, for some reason I just have to, you know, I seem to be kind of at, at the kind of the managing director, but yeah, I just, I, I don't think I do know as much, as much as I'm meant to know. And I think that, you know, that's what I'm afraid of people kind of really kind of finding out. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that makes you one very human. Yeah. And two likely, uh, one of the great one of the great uh, challenges of leadership, in my opinion, is that, you know, you're kind of, to me, like society is your, and, and I think this is shifting, but the, like the vulnerability and leadership of, I don't need to know it all. Like I grew up in a culture where your boss kind of knew it all. Mm. And that, there's nothing wrong with it. That was just kind of the way your boss knew how to do it. And that was great. And now it's like, hey, like, I actually don't know it all. I need your, I need your support. I think um, that is shifting in some, like, I think digital marketing obviously is a pretty, forward-looking industry it's modern modern industries it's actually like hey it's okay that my boss doesn't know everything Mm -hmm. we have a team of us to do it and the vulnerability is actually what has people want to be on the team with you yeah and like letting you lean into your strengths versus having to be the be it all so the second part of this question that you don't know is coming 
well, you might know because you've listened to the show, is uh, what do you do to compensate for that thing that you're afraid might be true about you? So, as I said, I, I surround myself with people who do know more, basically, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and that can only make all of us look better. Basically, that's 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 yeah. how I try and run the business. So they make me look good. Basically, yeah. that's that's how we do. And uh, I don't necessarily always take yeah. credit, but sometimes I do. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah. but uh, yeah, that's so, why you get. That's why that's why it's your agency. You got to take credit. Sometimes. Well, I'm obviously there's, I'm obviously good at something. If even if I don't know all the ins and outs, yeah. you know, specifically of of what I'm meant to be kind of uh, known for, uh, I can obviously yeah. run, run the agency. So so yeah, so surround yourself with people who know more than yourself, um, who yeah. can do the job better than you can. Um, and uh yeah i think um uh it doesn't matter if they know it and you know it and everybody knows it that's just you know i think that's a good thing yeah all right since i've got you here you run a team you're a leader of people i'm going to ask you something that's uh i don't ask everybody but this is you know for really for the audience Mm -hmm. people are you know people are going to be listening they might be looking for work or like what do people look for when they hire so you had said skills at the beginning but I'm curious if you were going to pick one thing that has you be a heck yes to somebody like, and let's say the skills are the same. Yeah. I like the skills are the same. Tactically, you know that somebody can do the role. When you're hiring, James, what is the thing that you want most for an employee that you would bring on? So I think there's a certain, these are really kind of like um, passe answers, but you, you want someone with a bit of energy who's kind of, who's obviously kind of shown some interest in, in what they're going to be doing in what the business will, you know, they've, they've done a little bit of homework, you know, just someone who's just shown some interest and enthusiasm about those kind of things, assuming they've got all the kind of skills and they've got a bit of a background. Um, you know, I don't care, you know, if they've been to university, if they've got a degree, I don't, that doesn't, because I haven't, and my degree, yeah. well, my, well, my degree is in, in in something completely different to what we do now. So, so I can't kind of like yeah. expect it from anyone. But yeah, is that kind of is that spark? Is that energy? Is that 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 enthusiasm? That engaging or and wanting to kind of to learn and to know more and to be part of that team. And I, and I know they're all kind of basically synonyms for the same thing. But there's usually you can sure. you can yeah. you can get it. And I'm not. I don't really care about kind of you know this whole company culture thing, because we're not a big enough company to have, you know, a massive kind of company culture. Right. So we don't really have to worry about those, those kinds of things, but there's just, this just enthusiasm, you know, someone who just wants to engage, you know, is excited to be kind of part of the world that we, we live in and work in. Um, and that I was, um, yeah. that's what kind of, that's what really excites me when I'm talking to people about becoming part of the team. Yeah. Yeah. I help some of my clients with hiring. Like I don't hire for them, but they'll, you know, as a coach, like sometimes they'll be like, Hey, I'm considering these two people and work through it. It's a bummer when you have the person that you know could be great, but they don't bring that. Mm. Yeah. If you, you probably run into that where you're like, God, this person would be so good for the team, but I just, I'm just not feeling it. Yeah. They're not bringing the, they're yeah. not bringing the juice. Yeah. I um, mean, you know, modern, modern hiring might say you would probably kind of take them both on, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because, I, yeah. because, you know, actually, you know, you know the interview process you know obviously we're in we're in the recruitment space we're mark we're marketers yeah. for recruiters that's what we do and sometimes yeah. people just don't bring their a game to an interview it's a very that's false right. environment to put people through right and they just don't yeah don't, don't perform great so you know there's all kinds of techniques where you take them out of the environment put them into i mean when i when i i had an interview in a pub once right for a job you know um i sat great. and sat down with the, the my, my future boss and we had a drink um and it's a different setting. Now, some people might find that really disconcerting. You know, obviously at the minute and through the kind of pandemic, the last couple of couple of years, people have just been doing it all online, which again, it gives a, can be very difficult to kind of make that kind of whole hiring process. Um, so there's no kind of one kind of size fits all to kind of to hiring, but you'll know it. And and I think as a, as an employer, you just have to be aware that you're putting someone through quite a potentially stressful situation. An interview is, is, is really yeah. stressful. And that, you know, yeah. sometimes people, you know, don't act their best and you've kind of got to use a bit more intuition and maybe there's other ways of going around that. And, um, and as I said, take them out of that environment is sometimes a, a kind of a way of, of kind of going about it. And, uh, maybe even within the interview, don't get too hooked up on talking about their background, their experience, the kind of, mm. what would you bring to the role, you know, more of, yeah. of, of them as a person. And you'll kind of pick up on those kind of things, I think. Yeah. Thanks, James. I appreciate you doing a little improv with me here because I was just totally off the cuff, but I got you here. Let's get some more wisdom. So (laughs) 
as we start to wrap up world philosophy how do you see the world i mean it's a so it's a difficult question again it's like it's, it's like picking your favorite yes. favorite novel my again i think you'll have kind of noticed a trend about my kind of slightly kind of uh upbeat and, and uh kind of philosophy around everything is that this is a world that's full of amazing people right and we just need to know more of these yeah. people get to know more of these people understand people different people's viewpoints um and take the time to talk to different people doesn't matter whether that, whether that's ethnicities age whatever those kind of things in just kind of be more open uh the world is full of great people okay i i would suggest that the world is probably 99.999% full of really good people just trying to make it through get through living their life yeah. enjoying what's enjoyable to them <clears throat> being sad about the things that is sad to them and the more we can understand that and kind of you know empathize with that and be in tune with that uh i think the world would probably be a much better place i love that yeah you and i share that philosophy i believe the world is mostly good it's unfortunate that that 0.1 percent seems to take up a lot of time energy it's who, who, who shouts the loudest it right a it's a lot of havoc it's a it's a good marketing place whoever shouts the loudest right you know i mean it's it's, it's yeah. You know I mean? you know? yeah um but yeah, yeah you're right exactly. it is it is a sad state yeah. of affairs but yeah so james i have no doubt when the audience listens to this episode they're gonna to want to know more about you know more about what you're up to especially if you're in the recruiting space and i've had some recruiters uh people in the recruiting space on the show that i'd love to connect you to connect you with how can people connect with you and find you so um you can either search for think in circles so that's t-h-i-n-k-i-n circles so it's not thinking it's think in a little bit like thinking outside the box that's where they kind of Mm -hmm. so think in circles you can go thinkincircles.com you can look or look uh, search for me personally which is james whitelock that's w-h-i-t-e-l-o-c-k um uh you'll find me on twitter on linkedin is where i spend a lot of my time so yeah feel free to connect with me on, link, on linkedin um but yeah i've got you can also on instagram wherever wh- whichever your kind of social kind of media platform of choice is apart from uh tiktok and telegram where i'm not kind of currently you know so but uh <laughs> yeah. yeah linkedin is no probably TikTok, the best place. but everything else is great yeah linkedin is the best place probably yeah Awesome. Yeah. Well, and for the audience, we'll put all of that in the show notes so you can just click into the show notes and uh, please connect with James. As you can tell, James is an awesome guy. Full disclosure, James reached out to me over LinkedIn and I was like, hey, this guy seems cool. And here we are recording for uh, well, some and, hundreds, and, hundreds and, of people to and, listen. And again, for full disclosure, we were going to, you know, you, hopefully you're going to be a kind of guest on the Marketing Rules podcast. And I would love to come on and talk to you about marketing. I know nothing about marketing for recruiting, but I know a lot about marketing for some other stuff. So Marketing's marketing at the end of the day is, is exactly. the way I see it. Exactly, exactly. All right, James. So thank you for being on. I really enjoyed getting to know you here. Love if you would leave us with some words of wisdom, short and sweet. So this is uh, based on a quote from Simon Le Bon that I've tried to live my life by a certain amount. So it's no nostalgia, no regrets, and always mix your drinks. Always mix your drinks? Yeah. <laughs> That's fan. Oh, I love that. That's fantastic. Anytime a guest leaves, uh, drops a quote that has something to do with alcohol, I'm I'm super into it. <laughs> well, James, thank you so much. Great to uh, great to have you on today. Can't wait to have everybody get to know you and meet you, and we will be connecting soon. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. All right, man. That was fun. Thanks for listening to another episode of Talking to Cool People with Jason Frizzell. If you enjoyed today's episode, please tell your friends. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook and give us a shout out or take a moment to leave a review on iTunes. If something from today's episode piqued your interest and you'd like to connect, email us at podcast at jasonfrizzell.com. We love hearing from our listeners because you're cool people too.